This is video number four uh, for phylogenetic reconstruction. It will actually be in two parts, uh, and so this will be the first part of it. And we're going to talk about reconstruction now using molecular characters. So just as a reminder, remember we have these two different paths that we follow for uh, developing phylogenetic trees, depending on whether or not we work on morphological characters or molecular characters. And now we're going to focus on this pathway with the molecular characters. So just like with morphological features, we first have to gather our data when we work on molecular characters. So what are the molecular characters that we want to work with? Basically, we're working with DNA and protein sequences. Each nucleotide or amino acid in a protein or a DNA sequence is a character. And we consider each one of those bases or amino acids as independent of all the other ones. Now, this is different from morphological characters where there might be non-independence of characters. We didn't talk about this too much previously, but if you think about it, for example, the left side of your body is very similar to the right side of your body, and that's because they have a common uh, developmental program. And so you wouldn't want to measure the left side of your body and the right side of your body and treat that as if you were getting two independent pieces of information. Um, but we assume, in most cases, there are some exceptions, that each position in a DNA or a protein sequence is independent of all the other ones. Now what this means is that potentially there are millions or even billions of characters available for analysis. So for example, with human beings, our uh, genome sequence is about three billion base pairs in length. If you used the entire uh, human genome sequence uh, to reconstruct a phylogeny, then you would have three billion characters to work with. The first thing we have to do, though, after we gather our data, is align it. Um, and what do we mean by this? Well, you get a bunch of sequences, for example, A, G, C, T, T, A, T, and another sequence, A, C, C, T, G, A, T. And there are going to be differences between them. So for example, here at position number two, we have a G and a C. And at position number five, we have a T and a G. And there's these differences between them. And what we want to do is align those sequences with each other so that positions that are evolutionarily uh, the same are lined up with each other. And that was very easy in this little example I just drew here. Um, but there are going to be other situations where it'll be more complex, and we'll see that in just a second. So what we're looking for here is something we call positional homology. The idea is that each column in our alignment represents the true evolutionary history of a position in that DNA or protein sequence, okay? And sometimes sequences can be very, very complicated, and we may not be really certain that we've gotten the positional homology correct. And if that happens, we leave those areas out of analysis. Uh, the whole idea here is not to create artificial evolutionary histories uh, that aren't uh, what truly happened. Okay, now once we get the alignment, then we just follow the rules of parsimony to do the reconstruction. We write out all the possible phylogenies, and we choose the one that has the least number of steps or evolutionary changes in it. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of alignments. Uh, I need to orient you here so that you understand what you're looking at. The top sequence is what we're going to call a reference sequence. And then each row is a sequence of the same uh, DNA stretch uh, from different organisms. This is actually taken from HIV. And what I've done to make it really easy to see where the differences are is these other sequences besides the top one, if they agree with the top sequence, I've put a dot there. And I've only shown where they disagree. And so what you can see here is that these sequences are very, very similar to one another. There's only a few changes. And so we have a pretty high degree of confidence here that we've gotten the positional homology right because they're not changing very fast. Alternatively, let's look at this alignment. This is also taken from HIV, but from a part of the, uh, the genome in the HIV virus that is evolving much more rapidly. And what we can see here 
is that there have been a lot of changes relative to one another in the, this set of sequences. And in fact, there's also been an insertion or a deletion. We don't know which one, but if we go down here, we can see in this part where there is a set of dashes, we've introduced those dashes in the alignment because these two sequences that have the dashes are completely missing the, uh, the base pairs that are found in all of the other sequences. And so in order to get the best alignment, we have to introduce what we call a gap uh, to make sense of that. This is a region of DNA where the alignment uh, is iffy. There's enough change going on that we're not sure that we're getting the alignment right, and therefore we're not sure we're getting the positional homology correct uh, of all of these different bases.